and your arms were done. And, and I've been he like, said he was going to run in that interference and he got behind me. I don't know where you were going. Oh, well. In God's time. There you go. And he's very patient. Very, very patient. <laughs> I have struggled with that word patience all my life, and I understand well, I, God's time. I thought that was somebody who went to the doctor. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. Like mine. Like mine. How are you? Praise God. You're looking good. That's exactly you are looking good. Numbers come in, my white blood says, I don't care about the numbers. The Lord's got the numbers. I'm telling you, you're looking good. Jesus, Jesus has got them. Oh, look Sorry. at that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, good. That's yeah, good. All the white blood cells are you? good. Y'all are kind of feeling a little rowdy this morning. I don't know. It's hard to get everybody dialed in. So I am doing a, a my own version of a mic check. This is not for the room. This is for the, the virtual crowd. But I can only stand still for so long that I had to try to get back to a little bit of mobility. And I'm, I'm trying this one out just to see if it helps on the computer side. But see how it works out. If uh, during the, the song service, especially the preaching, if you can hear it, it would be nice for one person to comment from Facebook, one person from YouTube to be able to say yay, nay, whatever that would be. So I'm trying to get that trouble shot. But glad you're here today. Pray the Lord's blessings on you. It's exciting to see what God has in store. And just seeing some folks I haven't seen in a while or in a, in a different way. And welcome to the visitors. There's gift bags in the back and the 
kind of by the door, and we've got a, a lot of announcements you'll see scrolling through the pages here. There's a calendar back there by the donuts, so we put it there so we know that you'll find it. And uh, if we run out of coffee or donuts, it, well, I don't know what to think about that. Well, should be pretty sad. I know we're still kind of growing the church, and we kind of take a little bit different approach to growing the church just because we got so many young families, and uh, the Andersons had their baby yesterday, and I don't know if there's a slide on it or not, and you're probably going to get some more details, but uh, excited about that and seeing how that comes together. Uh, love hearing the, the babies and the kids. After the, the song service, we have our Sunday school ladies, and it's, it's kind of Sunday school, it's kind of ch children's church, but towards the back, and they do a great job. I've never seen a kid leave a room with an empty hand. So you'll get all kinds of stuff. Hope your refrigerator is ready. Pin some stuff up there. So let's start with the word of prayer. Righteous God, you're glorious and mighty in our lives. We thank you for the goodness we find in Jesus. Lord, we are nothing without our Savior. We humbly come before you, God, as we seek your presence in your throne. We ask God, as your scripture says, that your kingdom come and your will be done. That... We seek Jesus as the rightful ruler and king of our heart. Lord, to know that you have a plan, you have a desire, you have a goal, and Lord, you include us in it, and it just blows our mind to realize how faithful you are even when we're not. So we thank you, God, that you use broken vessels, that you allow for us to be able to be used of your kingdom, but also, Lord, to serve you, and that we be able to trust and obey with knowing what your word is and the move of your spirit, God, we ask that as we prepare our hearts for worship, that we would be in tune with you, synchronized, and walking in your spirit as we, Lord, we come before you thanking you for it, rejoicing and asking in the name of Jesus, amen. <laughs> you want to make your announcement now, or are you going to keep everybody in suspense? Right. <laughs> Two inches, okay, I'm good now. So, uh... Uh, we have got some really exciting news, other than uh, Ben and his baby kind of trumped this news, but that's okay. <laughs> we got some really exciting news for the church, so for the last three or four months, uh, we have a rodeo Bible camp team that's been meeting with the elders and putting plans together for our first rodeo Bible camp. And if you don't know what rodeo Bible camp it is, a, for us it's going to be a three-day camp. And it's going to be for kids from 10 to 18 years old. They're going to come in, and we're going to instruct on barrels. We're going to instruct on poles. We're going to instruct on team roping. But most of all, we're going to instruct on Jesus Christ. Amen. So it is life-changing for the kids. Uh, it is life-changing for anybody that is associated with that. We have a small team that we've put together so far to get all the details done. But there are some things that I need from the church first thing that I need from the church is prayer for this. My wife and Megan and Miranda and Ryan and all of us have been working on this. Sandy's leading it up. But pray for us. Pray for the kids that we don't even see their faces and we don't know it's going to be there yet because, like I said, it's going to be life-changing. What we do is we have instruction for two days and on the third day, we invite mom and dad to come in and grandma and grandpa they have a little rodeo to show the skills that they that they learn. But we're going to have chapel every day. We're going to have Bible study every day. We're going to have all these things that is Christ-centered. And on the last day, if anybody has given their, their life to Christ, we're going to have a baptism right there in front of mom and dad and the rest of them. And Sandy and I do this uh, at a cowboy church in uh, Kansas. And last year we had 50 kids that showed up. It was an overnight camp. Uh, we had about 15 that gave their life to Christ, that rededicated their life Amen. to Christ, and we had 12 that we baptized. Amen. It is life-changing, guys. So first of all, you guys pray for us. Second of all, we need you guys to volunteer to help us. It's going to take a crew. It's going to take probably 20, 25 people to put this on and put it on right, and we'll be getting with each and every one of you. If you are interested in helping us, <laughs> See one of the Rodeo Bible Camp teams. My wife is in Texas showing her cutting horse right now, but she'll be back. She's the number one person in charge of all this. I'm just a mouthpiece today. So, um, And then uh, if you want to sponsor buckles or prizes or anything like that, 
we need any and all help that you can give us. And we love you guys so much and be praying for us. And we, we expect big things out of this. And the volunteers that we need is anywhere from checking car ends to being security to uh, groundskeepers to keeping the kids in line to uh, arena checkers to all. We, look, if you want to help, you just come up and sign up and we'll find something for you to do. So you don't have to know anything about rodeo. You don't have to know anything about horses. Got to take instruction real well. Uh, the date's going to be the second week in June. Second week, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And I'll get you. Uh, Megan and Sandy worked for a long time. They got some slides. We'll have we'll have slides, and then once a month we'll probably come up and announce it. So thank y'all. Yeah, praise the Lord. It is good to be in Corner Post Cowboy Church this morning. And I want to add something. What Ricky said. Now don't be surprised when I'm adding something, but. We had, um, there's a young man that came here when he was really small and we were still over in the other building and he came almost every Sunday and came to, to church and he now goes to another church and that's okay. I mean, you know what? If you come here and this doesn't fit you and you find something, that's great. He went to a church with a friend of his. They went to a church camp this summer and I was talking to his grandmother and she said it changed his life. He was having trouble at school. He didn't know what he wanted to do. She said he came back from that church camp a different teenager, a totally different teenager. She said he is planning his life out. He is serving the Lord, and he is happy and doing what he should be doing now. That's what God does, and that's why we do these camps, and that's why we reach out to these youth. God changes lives. And not only lives, He changes generations because of it. And we want to praise the Lord for that. We want to work hard, so that's what we do. We're going to stand up this morning and sing a very old, very familiar song. One verse of it is very familiar, and you can try the rest of the verses. You'll know this one.
is your favorite time in the morning. It is time to go find somebody you don't know and shake their hand.
I've ever seen it here, but my wife, she's going to Texas and she was uh, uh, showing her cut horse and she called me. She asked me about this song. She said, uh, I really love the way you do this song, Ricky. Can you send it to me? Because I just, Jerry, our trainer, is asking some pretty deep questions about what do you think it's going to be like when you get to heaven? You know, everybody that's a Christian wants to know what it's going to be like when you get to heaven. Are you going to be known as your own when the Bible says you will? Are you going to be able to say, well, that's Brother Mike, he was a pastor of our church. Or that's my mom, that's my dad. Right? But this song talks about seeing your family there. But it really talks about the one thing that we all need to see, and that's Jesus. He's the one that saved us. He's the one that died on the cross. And I don't know about you guys, but he's the one. He's the one I want to see first. And everybody else I want to see second. But there's a lot I want to see for second place. But let's see if I can try to get through this this morning.
presence. Lord, we feel your presence so strong, Lord. And I just thank you so much for each and every person that's here, God, this morning. Lord, I just pray that the pastor brings good word, Lord, that it touches our hearts, God. Lord, I pray most of all that if there's anyone in here that needs a touch from you, God, up there, that needs to get right with you, Lord, that they find you this morning, God. Lord, I just pray your blessings on this place. In Jesus' holy name, I pray. Amen. 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 Horse, what color would I want to be? Has anybody ever asked that of yourself? 
Okay, I know, I'm odd. But I'm going to give you my answer, but I'm not going to tell you flat out. You've got to look for it a little bit. But if I was a horse, what color would I want to be? So I'm going to start the passage in an area where it's Genesis 12. Abram, even before his name has changed, even before the commitment, the promise that he would be the father of God's people, that the, the descendants of Abraham and his then barren wife would be more numerous than the stars in the sky and the sand on the sea, that they would have no idea of what God had intended for them. But Genesis 12, Scripture describes getting on the trailer and not having any idea where you're going. And I'm going to kind of arrange this a little bit different. These are probably, for some of you, familiar passages, but maybe the arrangement's a bit different. I'm pretty sure the outcome, because like most of my sermons, you have no idea where the trailer is going. <laughs> Hopefully it makes it back to the farm. But I don't know. No guarantees today. Might be taking you to the cell pen. Who knows? So in Genesis 12, from the NIV, it says, this is the Lord having a conversation. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Do you see the idea of get on the trailer? So, owner of these two horses, if they were able to understand, if they were able to communicate, if they had any, any idea of distance and time and travel and the details, and the owner says, Get on the trailer, I'm taking you to another country. They'd be like, oh no. And as I'm, I'm thinking through this, it's really, it, it, this happens all the time in scripture. It happens, I think, all the time in everybody's life. Is you have no idea what God has <laughs> planned for you. Scripture says that it is beyond your comprehension. So I'm going to estimate, I'm just taking a guess here, and not everybody's going to participate, but if you weren't born in Arkansas, raise your hand. Man, more than half. Wow. Anybody that has been born within a 20, no, we'll, we'll go 100 mile radius of where you are today. Who's born within 100 miles of here? Okay, somebody's lying. Well, I guess Oklahoma, that would be okay. That'd be 100 miles. And if God were to tell you at whatever age you're able to comprehend, let's say, and, and I, I realize, you know, you could comprehend at 10, you could understand more at 15, at 20, I don't know if we ever know, but if, let's say at 25 years of age, you're a full-on adult, at least you ought to be, and paying your own bills, which includes cell phones, I don't know if that's going to be anybody in the room, but let me step on everybody's toes with this. And God would say, okay, I am going to send you to wherever he sent you in the last time frame. Would you have any idea what he had in store? Can I say something real quick? I guess you're going to. Go I ahead. Want to, I want to introduce him. You got your friend with you? No. This is my baby boy. Oh, your son. Want to talk about embarrassing that dude? <laughs> well, he's got to go. Oh. He's got chaos, Kevin. He's been down here since yesterday morning. Well. And he's back to Missouri? Out. Yeah. All right. I just wanted everybody to meet him. <laughs> okay. Hey, you want everybody to meet you? You've been met. You've been met, Kevin. Okay, man. We're proud to have you today. But I'm glad to be here also. Blessings on you. That's great. That's exciting to have your kids in church. Exciting to have some restoration, how these come around. And so you might have driven the farthest today to be at church. I don't know. You might get the... Well, we got a special donut for you in the back. <laughs> well, no icing, no wrinkles. You know where Buckscuff, Arkansas is? I'm sorry? You know where Buckscuff, Arkansas is? Not right off. We, we, was there, we was there at 830 this morning. Wow. And we drove back and went to the house and then got here. We blew late. We made it. You did. I'm glad you're here. So think about how... how Abram is being told. I mean, just try to put yourself in his sandals. Just think through this idea. By name, put fill in the blank. 
Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. So Abram is being told to not only leave the family farm, but to leave <clears throat> the area, the town, the state that they had one, and the nation to go to a place. Now, I know this about MapQuest. I know this about Rand McNally, whichever generation you are. You usually have to have <clears throat> a place where you're starting, which is easy. Zip code, 727. Six one, but normally you have to put in a destination to figure out how to get there. <coughs> Abram has no idea. The Lord said, "I need you to load up, get your stuff, get on the trailer. I'm taking you somewhere. I can tell you, and you still understand." In fact, he goes ahead in the next couple of verses and gives him some idea of direction that is beyond his comprehension. So keep in mind, Abram is. 75-ish, him and his wife, no children, he's grown up here, this is basically Ur of Mesopotamia, and he's being told something amazing, I will make you into a great nation, and I'll bless you, I will make your name great. And you'll be a blessing. Even that verse is interesting because the name he's calling by now is the name he's going to make great. He's going to change his name. And when he changes his name, that name will be great. He'll become the father of God's chosen people. Can you imagine? I will bless those who bless you. Still true today. And whoever curses you, I will curse and I say amen. This is so important as you're watching the news today. Whoever blesses Israel and God's people is blessing God. Whoever curses God's people is cursing God. They rarely even need to defend themselves. They just need to stay on the trailer. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. You know, a lot of times the Jewish folks think, well, we're God's chosen people. I don't know if they ever stopped to realize what they were chosen for. They were not chosen so that every one of Abraham's descent would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and live in eternity with the Father. That was not their chosen for. They were chosen to be the people that would usher in the Messiah for the whole world to accept. And so many times they get hung up on, we're the people, we're the ones, we're, we're God's chosen. Well, you're not God's chosen unless you choose him first. And to know that Jesus is what ultimately is being planned. The destination is Canaan. It is the promised land. It's still under the territory and the area that is heavily, heavily refuted about who it belongs to. And it is a hot spot. And always will be because of how it's been set up. Watch Jerusalem. Watch what's happening to God's people. Whoever blesses them will be blessed. So I keep going through, and I want you to find out, as we think about these two horses, and something's caught their attention out the back side of the trailer. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just a stock photo here, but they're, they're both looking. They're both kind of watching. And horses really have a pretty, pretty high intelligence. In fact, just a couple of examples for maybe the folks that aren't around horses in a lot. If my hay fever gets a little low, I have horses that will tell me. I don't even have to look at it. I'll be outside, and they'll start whinnying to me. And I'll look and say, oh, are you getting a little low? And I already kind of knew it, but they don't know I know, so i got to have a little conversation with them. And I'll say, well, I'm coming back out in a couple hours. I'm going to give you a, a bale of hay, so just hold on to your... <laughs> I know. But it's, uh, I'm in this place where, you know, the <laughs> they know some stuff. They know that when I get onto a trailer and or you saddle me, I'm going to the bathroom. And I'm going to do it right there. I don't care who's watching. I'm fixing to go to work, and I'm going to lighten the load. And I'm going to get ready. It's like they couldn't make an unscheduled trip later and go somewhere. Because it doesn't matter where they're at. They seem to go. But that's how you make the horse function 
and they're loaded up, they're ready to go, and they have no idea, even once they get there, where they are, where they're going, or what they're going to be doing. They have two things. Trust me and obey me. Trust and obey. It's exactly what Abraham had to do. He couldn't fathom this. How is it even possible? I have no children. My wife is beyond the years of being able to give a child. How is this going to even work? So if I go on over here, just a couple of chapters. Actually, Genesis 13, I believe, will give you a good direction. Genesis 13 and verse 12. Just to give you an idea. So Abram was in Ur, Mesopotamia. And a chapter later, he ends up in the land of Canaan. Abraham lived, this is 1312, Abraham lived in the land of Canaan. While Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. So the Canaan, even, and, and I'd have to get my time frame out, but this is a, I'm going to guess, maybe 600 years before Israel walks into and claims the promised land. And the big time block is 430 years of captivity in, in Egypt. That they didn't go nowhere. They were born there. They died there. Their children were there. All they knew was Egypt for 430 years. So the Lord is telling them, telling Abram, I'm going to do this. You're not going to know where you're going. I'll show you. And even though you live there, your family is going to be gone for 600 years before they get to really claim it and fulfill the promise in which I mentioned. And then even thousands of years later before Jesus Christ would come to become our Messiah. So this is a prophecy. This is, I'm, I'm going to take you somewhere. You're not going to get it. But it's almost like if you've ever had a legacy genetics in your horses. So whenever I was raising and breeding some horses... I tell you, my, my raising kind of started a little slow. I had a deal worked out with uh, with James and Shelley. James would let me borrow his stud horse, and I would breed my mares, and then James would get picked of the crop, and I'd keep the others. That's kind of how I started. Uh, that's my comment miser breeding program was as a borrowed horse, and James would let me do that a couple years at a time. And I remember a couple of horses that he would pick from. He'd always pick the best one. He had such a good eye for horses. <laughs> and, but I, you know, I was good because I, I ended up with two or three. And he'd get the one and I'd get two or the three. And, and it was a great arrangement for me where eventually I got to the place where I raised my own stud. And I'd raised my own mares. So then I had the beautiful world of grand horses. Several grand horses. And being able to know... The temperament, the background, how the parents and the grandparents, where they came from, they did. I have had enough horses for a long enough period of time that I, I knew their backgrounds so well. But I had no idea where these horses would have come from or where they've ended up over the years. So you have all these ideas of, you know, whether you call a horse several states away or horses move from other countries and how these things are brought together, you know, as far as... The United States goes, and my equine history is a little weak, but you had the, the Mustang horses that were primarily the Spanish barbs and Andalusians that were brought in from Spain and Europe, and then you end up with different breeds and genetics, and the Arabians eventually came from the Middle East, and you have the draft horses, the cold bloods that came from England and different parts of Europe like that. And now we've got this hodgepodge of even created breeds, the most popular breed in the world, the AQHA, not even a hundred years old, built on foundation horses of what was designed to be the greatest working ranch horse in the world. And they had no idea where they would have come from. But the Lord had us has a plan. I'm looking at this passage from Genesis 12. He makes the commitment. This is what I'm going to do. 13, he gets some waypoint. Okay, I'm in Canaan. This is the land you're going to get. But it really doesn't start coming together until you go to Hebrews chapter 11. So in Hebrews 11, 
This is the faith chapter, as many of you will know. You can also see many of the times that the early church and the Jews would, would lay claim to their, their ancestry of being descendants of Abraham. They thought that was good enough for salvation. They kind of missed the trailer on part of that idea. But you read it, Hebrews chapter 11, and it starts off, I'm going to read in verse 1 and 2, and then I'm going to pick up a little bit and go to 8. But in verse 1 and 2 it says, Now, faith is confidence. In what we hope for. And assurance for what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So I'll take that part. Skip down to verse 8. And you'll see, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place, he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed, and went. And even though he did not know where he was going, by faith, he made his home in the promised land. Like a stranger in a foreign country, he lived in tents. As did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he's as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as countless as the sand on the seashore. Abram, load up on the trailer. Trust me. Obey me. You see this pattern throughout Scripture. You think about even whenever... Adam and Eve were banished from this, the garden. Scripture doesn't say they were told where to go. When the ark landed on Mount Ariok, Arafat, I always get those mixed up in my mind. When it sat on top of the mountain, they had no idea. And for sure, during the, the time that it was sailing, no direction. When Joseph was sold into bondage, had no idea where he'd be taken to. You can see this pattern throughout Scripture, and yet what do we get hung up on today? God, and you tell me what I need to do and where I'm going. And I'll give you the answer. No. I'm not going to tell you. You need to trust me, and you need to obey me. In fact, it's almost irrelevant where we go. It's who are we going with. We have some mild, minuscule idea of what heaven's like. That was mentioned in the song. You can't even imagine. We don't have words in our vocabulary. We don't have emotions and ideas and thoughts to really bring out the, the grandeur, the splendor, the amazing <laughs> glory of what being in God's presence must be like. What we do know is we can't get there unless we trust and obey. I'm really concerned that so many times I try to figure out what God is up to. And I don't do anything until I find out. Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know who to do it with. I don't know what, how, to, how to arrange this. And that's not faith. Faith is what we don't yet see that we hope for. But we can't enter into that promised land. I believe that everywhere we end, that God has a promised land for us. I believe that if you look at the foundation and the creation of the United States and how the melting pot is assembled here, that this was a promised land. So many different parts and communities across the world 
where you're looking at different societies and cultures and traditions that God has arranged people to be at certain places, certain times, certain connections, and that he would choose to make a nation out of the faithfulness of one man and his wife who would then become the family of God. The nation of God would choose. Trust and obey. <laughs> So I want to come back and look at this passage, a couple of different examples in the book of Deuteronomy 28. I know we're going backwards this time, but I'm trying to do it more like a chronological. I guess you hopping and skipping all over the place. That's what Dan and I were talking about this morning. We read the Bible so many times in order of sequence and not necessarily the timing of how it's arranged. But in Deuteronomy I'm stalling right now. I'm getting there. I think it's going to be verse 1, I hope. Yeah, there we go. It says, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all of his commandments. I'm sorry, I had that word. Follow all of his commands. I give you today. The Lord your God will set you high above all nations on the earth, and these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. So I put trust and obey in. Scripture calls it the same way. We'll read that later in John 14. But it is not possible to obey God and keep his commandments if you don't trust him. I can't get where the owner wants to go unless I get on the trailer. I have a certain level of trust and a certain level of obedience. And even once I get there, I still have to trust and obey. The slightest movement of a rein, the slightest pressure of a leg, of a heel, of a spur, the twisting in the, the seat of the saddle, the subtleness, the direction. Now, we could go on a trail ride, and, and the Lord could plow ride us everywhere we're going, and he could drag us, kicking and screaming where we want to go. And sometimes that happens in our life. We probably all have a, a trail like that somewhere in our past where God is just yanking us around because we're not supple and soft and leading in a way that is sensitive to what he is leading us to and incapable of trusting and obeying. But it's almost like a, there's a word I, I'm not going to remember, but it's a conditionary phrase where I can't trust unless I obey, and I'm not obeying if I'm not trusting. It, had, it, it just flows together so well to the point where if you, this is timeless, it's not just for God's chosen nation who would usher in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, but it's all those who have been born into him and have accepted him. If you will obey me, if you obey the Lord your God, and carefully Follow all his commands I give you today. You know, those details that we, we don't wait until the trail to train the horse. Rarely would somebody take a green horse, never been saddled, never been haltered, load on a trailer, get it together, and then go on a trail ride. That doesn't happen a whole lot. But the training, the left, the right, the woe, the get up, the sidestep, the traverse, the spin, the sensitivity, being able to go into deep crevices, go ascend steep inclines, be able to forge a river, to be able to wade through the mud, to be able to be so well trusting that the Lord can then take us to a place we never could have imagined. And he chooses to include us. So I want to come back to this passage that I mentioned earlier in John. And in John 14, there's actually two in this, this chapter I wanted to kind of mount up to. And in John 14, it starts in verse 15. Now, I think you'll see the, the common thread that's pulling all this together. 
and in John 14, 15, Jesus speaking says, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me because I live you will also live. On that day, you'll realize that I am in my Father, and you're in me, and I'm in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I, too, will love them and show myself to them. <coughs> goes on to say, 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and he will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me and will not obey my teaching, these words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. And he continues to describe the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, and I see that so much on the trail where we are in tune, more in tune sometimes with a horse than we may be with our own creator. That horse is trusting us to lead them to a place of safety, to lead them to a place of where they can be sustained with food, with drink, that we're not just going to ride them out in the middle of nowhere, unsaddle them, turn them loose and kick them out to be on their own. Don't typically go on a trail ride where you don't come back with the same horse you took. Now I realize accidents and situations happen. But the whole goal is to be in fellowship. And so now I'm going to add love, then trust, then obey. And they're intermingled. To be out on a horse, you need it to some level of being able to trust them. Them trust you. The horse doesn't know where you're going, but goes along with you at the direction and the lead that you prescribe for it. What's interesting to me about the horse is typically when you're riding, you don't tell the horse necessarily which step to take. Horses have to figure out the moment by moment decision of, you know, you can, and I've done this a few times, you can drop the reins, especially when a horse is in front, and a lot of times that horse will follow the horse in front of them. When you drop the reins, you actually find out a lot about a horse because some will go straight, some will take the easiest path, some will stop, some will balk and fight, but the horse still has responsibility, even though it doesn't know where it's going, or maybe even where it's at or how it's going to get there, it still has every decision to make firm steps, to be submissive to the rider, to be obedient to the instruction, and to walk and to move at the speed that it's being asked to go. Now, horses have personalities, just like your kids do, and one all, you drop the reins and they want to run. Another, you've got to kick them all day just to get them to, to trot. And it's just, you know, I've seen that with having five children, I've seen that with having multiple horses, is just because they come from the same genetic makeup, the same background, and, you know, whether it's nurture versus nature or vice versa, doesn't prescribe how that personality of the individual is going to respond, but what I require, trust me, love me, and obey me. That's called relationship. That's what draws us in intimacy. You know, sometimes you may leave a, leave a horse tied up for hours on the day. This is a really a kind of a common training strategy for a horse that, that doesn't train well or doesn't obey well is to catch it in the morning, tie it up, and leave it all day long. 
It gets them where they're caught easier. It gets them where they'll come along and they'll bail a little bit quicker. But sometimes they get tied up to a hitching post or to a tree or to an inner tube or anywhere else you could, you could think to, tie them to, and you are making them wait because they're not ready to go with you. They're not ready to respond with love, with trust, and with obedience. So you have to tie them to the hitching post. And the horse bites it. So many times they'll try to break a halter, they'll break a lead rope, they'll, they'll stomp a hole in the ground, they'll be pulling everything they can get to. They just don't tie well because they haven't learned to love, to trust, and to obey. The outcome. God is so loving, trusting, and desires for us to be led by him. We can't understand where we're going or which path we're going to go to get there. In fact, a lot of times when I ride on a trail, I know where I'm going to start, and I know where I'd like to end up. But it doesn't always mean a set path. And I'm the kind of person, I don't like to, to ride one way and then ride one way back. I like to ride in a loop, in a circle, where I, I never see the same spot I've, I've already been to. And sometimes there's not a trail there. Sometimes I have to blaze a trail. Sometimes I have to cut through some brush. Sometimes I have to re renavigate. And I'm just watching this as I'm thinking about trail rides I've been on and the way that God is leading us in to do things that we have no idea what it's going to be. And if you, based on where you are now, were to look back, you would never even guessed it. You had no idea the good things God had planned for you and the things that you thought were just terrible. And how can you do this? It is trying to get you to trust him and to obey him. What, one of the things I liked about the genetics of the horses that I ended up keeping was they were really easy to break. Usually if I spent a day on a horse just kind of getting it accustomed to the saddle, riding, do some things, I could often take that horse on a trail ride with a buddy horse. I've had other horses where I could get to a certain level of comfort of getting on and off the, the saddle and moving it left and right, go back out the next day, and he had no idea who I was. <laughs> And those are horses that I would want to take you out into a place like you can imagine in this photo. But to realize that when we are willing to be with God, to be led by God, you know, even as I think about the Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And he will direct your paths. I remember being on a trail ride one time where we got to the edge. And one of the people I was with, she said, well, where are we going now? And I said, we're going to go over there. And she said, how do we get there? And I said, and I think she was not trusting very much at that point. In fact, I'm not sure she went on the trail ride with me. But we got done with this. I call it kind of like a trail ride for the man from the story River, you know, where you survive. And you feel that much closer to the people that you survived with. And we got done. But this is where a horse going down a hill so steep that you could do this and touch the ground. And I just, I was young. I was foolish. You know, I don't know if, if being good, really, really good with a horse is because you're an idiot or because you're that good. I don't know which one I was. Probably a mixture of both. But I would take a two-year-old and never been really ridden on a trail and, and riding in a parade. I wanted to find out what my limits were. I wanted to find out what the horse would do. And so I would push, push, push the limits to see how steep a terrain a horse could go down and how steep a horse could go up and what it could jump. And I've seen horses go straight up a 10-foot embankment that seemed like it was 90-degree angle. I didn't have my protractor with me. But as a place, I wouldn't have, I'd have been scooting on my backside getting up and down it without a horse. But the power and what a horse can do and the unlocking, I don't even know if a horse is like getting up there and thinking, where are we going from here? And you get to the edge of the, the cliff, and you give it a, a kick. I can't do it with both sides. I'm to fall down. And the horse just take a step off. And the horse get down and said, well, I never would have thought I would have made it. I never thought I would have made it back. You know, but so many times we want to have in our lifestyle everything mapped out for us. We want to know when and where and what details and what time and how do I do this, how do I do that. I'm going to tell you. I don't think that's how the Lord does it. I think he wants us to trust him. To obey him. Get on the trailer. Take the saddle. Accept my weight. Yield to my direction. 
Let me set your pace and let me set your direction. I will grow you stronger. I will take you places you never could have, could have believed. And I will go with you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to abandon you. I might leave you tied to the hitching post long enough to get your, your sorry butt start thinking about who I am and who's in control here. I might do that for a while. If you're frustrated with where you're at, like it might be because you need to do a little inventory and say, Lord, am I getting tied up because I'm not being obedient to your word? But we've got to start walking in a way of faith. Faith is considered righteousness. And so I don't know if anybody's out the riddle yet. If I was a horse, what color would I want to be? Now, I said it 20 times. I didn't say Palomino once. I would want to be an old bay. That's right. Lord, make me an old bay horse. Lord, we bless you. We thank you that you're faithful. We thank you, God, that you have plans for us, to prosper us, not to harm us, that, God, you have come to set the captives free, to lead us into a place, God, that's never been done before, to come into your presence and your glory, but to accomplish your purpose on the trail as we walk through life with you, being led by your spirit, that, God, you keep a rain on us, you keep a subtle touch, slight cues, very faithful. God, help us to be obedient. Let us be an old bay horse. Nothing fancy, nothing spectacular, nothing pristine in color, but God, that we be so obedient that others will know that we have walked with Jesus because we love you, God. We trust you, God. Help us to obey. Lord, I bless you and worship you, thanking you, God, for this word, this time and fellowship with friends and family to help move us down the trailhead to the place, God, of the great gathering we call heaven. We bless you. Thank you for the blessing.